Welcome back to our Network and System Security course. I'm thrilled to have you with me as we dive into our latest module, Module 15, Information Security Management. Before we jump in, I'd really appreciate your support. If you find this module helpful, please give us a thumbs up, share this video with your peers, and drop a comment below. We love hearing from you and your feedback helps us create even better content. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an update from us. In this module, we're going to explore the essentials of information security management, focusing on how organizations can protect their critical assets and manage security effectively. You'll learn about creating and implementing robust security policies, understanding risk management frameworks, and ensuring compliance with various security standards. This module is crucial in today's world where cyber threats are becoming more sophisticated and pervasive. Having a solid grasp of information security management is key. Whether you're gearing up for a career in cybersecurity or just looking to strengthen your understanding, this knowledge will help you stay ahead of the curve and make a real impact in the field. Let's get started and take your information security skills to the next level. Alright, let's dive into what you'll be mastering in this module. By the end of Module 15, you'll have a solid handle on two key areas of information security management. First up, we'll explore asset protection. You'll learn how to safeguard valuable assets in an organization, ensuring they're secure from threats and vulnerabilities. Next, we'll tackle risk management. You'll discover how to identify, assess, and prioritize risks to effectively manage and mitigate them. These skills are crucial for anyone aiming to make a mark in cybersecurity or information security management. They'll help you not just protect vital information but also build strategies to handle potential risks like a pro. Let's get started and build those skills. Let's dive into the first big topic, asset protection. Protecting assets is really at the heart of information security. It's all about making sure your organization's valuable resources, whether they're data, hardware, or software, are kept safe from any potential threats or damage. Asset protection isn't just a single task, it involves two main components. Asset management. This is about knowing what you have. You need to keep a detailed inventory of all your assets, understand their value, and know where they're located. It's like keeping track of your personal belongings, but on a much larger and more complex scale. Change management. As things evolve, whether through updates, upgrades, or changes in how your assets are used, you need a solid process in place to manage these changes. This ensures that modifications don't inadvertently introduce new risks or vulnerabilities. Alright, let's break down what we mean by an asset. At its core, an asset is anything that has positive economic value. But in the context of an enterprise, assets are a bit more nuanced. Here's what makes something an asset in a business setting. They provide value. Assets contribute directly to the business's operations or financial health. This could be anything from a piece of software that boosts productivity to valuable customer data that helps drive sales. They're not easily replaced. Think of assets like rare collectibles or specialized equipment. Replacing them isn't a walk in the park. It often requires a hefty investment of money, time, or specialized skills. It's not just a matter of hitting the buy now button. They contribute to corporate identity. Some assets are key to a company's identity or brand. This could include proprietary technology, unique designs, or even the reputation built over years. Losing these could impact how the company is perceived and valued in the market. Understanding these qualities helps you grasp why protecting assets is so crucial. They're not just physical items, they're integral to a business's success and its standing in the industry. Now let's break down the different types of assets in an organization. Data. This includes all your critical information like customer records and financial data. It's high value because it's hard and expensive to replace. Customized business software. Think of software built specifically for your company's needs. It's unique and hard to replace, so it's a major asset. System software. This is the basic software that helps other applications run, 
like operating systems. It's important but easier to replace than customized software. Physical items, these are tangible things like computers and routers. While necessary, they're generally easier to replace. Services, outsourced services like cloud storage or communication are crucial but more replaceable compared to the other assets. Understanding these helps you know what to focus on for protection and management. Next, we'll explore how to manage these assets effectively. Asset management is all about how an organization takes care of its assets to get the most value out of them. It involves a systematic approach to managing these assets, ensuring they are governed well and used efficiently. Think of it like managing your personal budget. Just as you want to make sure your money is spent wisely, organizations need to ensure their assets are used in the most cost-effective way to maximize value. Now, let's talk about Cybersecurity Asset Management, or CAM. CAM is where asset management meets information security. It's a process that keeps track of all your assets in real time, helping you identify potential security risks and gaps. Think of it as a high-tech inventory system that not only lists your assets but also scans for vulnerabilities that could be exploited. Why is this important? If an attack happens, CAM gives you an up-to-date list of assets so you can quickly assess the situation and respond effectively. Let's move on to the asset lifecycle. Every asset has a lifecycle that kicks off as soon as a need for it is identified. From there, the asset goes through several stages. It's planned, created, or acquired, then operated and maintained. Throughout its life, it's monitored for performance, and eventually, it gets replaced or upgraded when it's no longer viable. The costs associated with an asset can add up at different stages, so it's crucial to manage these expenses throughout its life cycle. Now that we've covered the life cycle, let's dive into asset acquisition, which is also known as asset procurement. Asset acquisition starts with identifying and securing an asset that aligns with a business goal. Once you've pinpointed what you need and got the green light to move forward, most organizations will use a bidding process to find the right vendor. There are two main types of bidding processes. Standard bidding process. This is the traditional way where vendors submit their proposals in response to a request for bids. E-bidding process. Here, the bidding happens online, which can streamline the process and make it easier to manage. Understanding these processes can help ensure you get the best value and the right fit for your organization's needs. Asset assignment and accounting is all about figuring out who owns an asset and what category it falls into. We classify assets based on a few key factors. Liquidity. How easy it is to convert the asset into cash. For example, cash is highly liquid, while real estate is less so. Usage. How the asset is used within the organization. This helps in determining its role and importance. Physical versus intangible. Tangible assets. These are physical items you can touch, like computers or furniture. Intangible assets. These have value but no physical form, like patents or brand reputation. Proper classification ensures that assets are managed effectively and that their value is accurately reflected in your records. Next up, let's talk about asset tracking and inventory. Asset tracking is all about keeping tabs on where your tangible assets are located. This is crucial because knowing the exact location of assets helps in managing them effectively and ensures that nothing goes missing. Inventory refers to the raw materials, work in progress, and finished goods that a business has on hand and is ready to sell. Proper inventory management helps maintain stock levels and supports smooth business operations. Asset enumeration is basically a detailed list of all assets provided by a seller. It's important for keeping an organized record and helps in managing and valuing assets accurately. Let's wrap up our discussion of assets with asset disposal, an essential part of asset management. Disposal typically involves two key steps. Asset decommissioning. This is when you officially withdraw an asset from service. It means you stop using it in your operations and prepare it for removal. Asset disposal. 
This is the physical removal of the asset from your premises. For assets that hold valuable data, there are additional steps. Data retention. Transfer any important data to a different device before you move on. Data sanitization. This involves thoroughly cleaning the asset to ensure no sensitive information remains. For paper media, the standard practice is to shred it to ensure that confidential information is completely destroyed. And there you have it. Asset disposal is all about making sure that once assets are no longer in use, they are properly decommissioned, removed, and their data is securely handled. Alright, let's dive into change management and how it ties into information security. In the world of business, standard operating procedures are your daily routines. They ensure things run smoothly, but they can also impact your information security if not managed properly. That's where change management comes into play. It's all about managing changes, whether it's updates, adjustments, or replacements, in a structured way. Here's how it breaks down. Change management policies. These are formal rules outlining what must be done when changes occur. Think of them as your high-level guidelines that set the stage for managing change. Change management procedures. These are the detailed steps you need to follow to comply with those policies. They provide the nuts and bolts of how to implement changes while keeping security in check. Understanding and implementing these concepts will help ensure that any changes you make don't compromise your security. Moving on, let's talk about documentation and its critical role in change management. Why is documentation so important? It's your key to maintaining an audit trail and ensuring you meet both internal and external compliance requirements. Here's the scoop. Documentation. Keeping detailed records is essential. It helps track changes, adjustments, and variations to assets, which is crucial for monitoring their impact on security. Tools for documentation. Change management doesn't always need fancy tools. You can start with spreadsheets and flowcharts to track changes and their effects. Specialized software. In larger organizations, things can get more sophisticated. Change management software suites offer advanced features to maintain digital change logs, making it easier to manage and review changes over time. Proper documentation ensures that you're prepared for audits and can quickly address any issues that arise from changes. Keep these practices in mind, and you'll be on top of your change management game. Knowledge Check Which of the following is a listing of assets by a seller of those assets? Asset enumeration, asset inventory, asset counting, or asset verification? Answer. Asset enumeration. Asset enumeration is a listing of the assets by a seller of those assets. Let's dive into the concepts of threats and risks, which are crucial for managing information security effectively. First up, assets are always at risk. A threat is any potential action that could cause harm to these assets. Essentially, threats are anything that could compromise your valuable resources. Now, how do organizations handle this? They need to assess the likelihood of occurrence. That's the chance that a threat will actually affect an asset. This helps in understanding how likely it is for a threat to become a real issue. So, what exactly is risk? It's a situation where there's exposure to some form of danger. Risk is not just about the threat itself. It's also about the consequences if the threat materializes and the vulnerabilities that make the threat possible. In simple terms, risk is a mix of threats, the potential actions that could harm, consequences, the impact if the threat happens, and vulnerabilities, the weaknesses that might allow the threat to occur. Understanding these elements helps organizations prepare and protect their assets effectively. Knowing the different sources of risk helps you understand what you're up against in terms of security challenges. 1. Internal and external risks. Internal risks come from within the organization. These might include employee errors or misconfigurations in systems. External risks are threats from outside the organization, such as cyber attacks from hackers or phishing scams. 2. Legacy systems. Older systems, or legacy systems, can be a major risk. They often lack modern security features and might not be supported with updates, 
making them vulnerable to attacks. 3. Multi-party risks. When multiple parties are involved, such as in partnerships or outsourcing, risks can arise from each party's security practices. It's important to ensure that all parties adhere to strong security measures. 4. Software compliance and licensing. Software compliance and licensing issues can also be a source of risk. Using software without proper licenses or failing to comply with software regulations can lead to legal and security problems. Understanding these sources helps in anticipating potential issues and implementing effective risk management strategies to safeguard your assets. Now that we've covered where risks come from, let's dive into how we analyze them. Risk analysis is all about identifying and evaluating the factors that could threaten the success of a project or goal. This is often referred to as risk identification. To make sure you're covering all bases, it's important to follow a structured methodology for risk analysis. Two key approaches are Risk Control Self-Assessment RCSA. This is a collaborative approach where both management and staff work together to pinpoint and assess risks. It's empowering because it involves everyone in the process, making it more comprehensive. Risk Assessment this involves a systematic evaluation of risks to determine their potential impact and likelihood. It's worth noting that identifying risks isn't always straightforward. Unconscious human biases can make it tricky to spot all potential risks, which is why having a structured approach is so valuable. By understanding and applying these methodologies, you can better anticipate and manage risks to protect your assets and achieve your objectives. As we dive deeper into risk analysis, it's important to understand how biases can affect our decision-making. Here are some common biases that can influence how we identify and assess risks. Aggregate bias. This occurs when we make assumptions about an individual based on data trends that actually apply to a larger group. It's like assuming one person's experience reflects everyone's. Anchoring bias. This happens when we fixate on certain pieces of information early on and let that initial data heavily influence our decisions, even if it's not fully relevant. Availability bias. This bias leads us to judge the likelihood of an event based on how often we hear about it. If something's frequently reported, we might think it's more common or likely than it actually is. Confirmation bias. This is when we form a conclusion first and then only seek out information that supports it, ignoring anything that might contradict our initial belief. Present bias. This is the tendency to prioritize immediate rewards or risks over long-term considerations. We might ignore future risks in favor of short-term gains. Framing effect. This bias occurs when our decisions are swayed by how choices are presented or worded, rather than the actual content. Fundamental attribution error. This is when we blame individuals for their mistakes, viewing them as part of their identity, rather than considering the context or external factors that might have contributed. Recognizing these biases can help you make more informed and objective risk assessments, leading to better decision-making and more effective risk management. When it comes to managing risk, the timing and frequency of your assessments play a crucial role. Here's a quick overview of the different types of risk assessments you might encounter. Scheduled assessment. This is a one-time assessment that's planned and conducted at a specific point in time. It's often used for initial evaluations or major project launches. Whenever necessary, ad hoc assessment. These assessments are performed as needed, usually in response to unexpected issues or emerging risks. They're flexible and based on current needs rather than a set schedule. Recurring assessment. These are assessments conducted on a regular, predetermined schedule, like quarterly or annually. They help keep risk management practices up to date and aligned with ongoing operations. Continuous assessment. This type of assessment happens year round. It involves ongoing monitoring and evaluation, providing real-time insights into risk factors and allowing for immediate responses to new threats. Choosing the right type of assessment depends on your organization's needs and the specific risks you're managing. Each approach has its benefits, and sometimes, a combination of these methods provides the best coverage for effective risk management. 
To determine how often you should conduct risk assessments, you can use one of two main approaches, qualitative or quantitative. Each has its own way of evaluating risk and can be suited to different needs. Qualitative risk assessment. This approach is more about making informed judgments based on observation and experience. It often uses scales or labels, like high, medium, or low, to categorize risk. For instance, you might rate a risk from 1 to 10 or simply classify it as high, medium, or low. It's a bit like using your intuition and expertise to gauge potential issues. Quantitative risk assessment. This method tries to put hard numbers on risk by analyzing historical data and statistical models. It's about using concrete figures to measure the likelihood and impact of risks. For example, you might use past incidents to estimate the probability of a risk event and its potential cost. Both approaches are valuable in their own right. Qualitative assessments are great for quick, flexible evaluations, while quantitative assessments provide a more data-driven perspective. Depending on your needs, you might use one or both to get a comprehensive view of your risk landscape. When it comes to quantitatively assessing risk, there are several useful tools you can rely on to predict the likelihood of an issue happening. These tools help you turn data into actionable insights. Mean time between failure, MTBF. This metric measures the average time between failures of a system or component. A higher MTBF indicates more reliable performance. Mean time to recovery, MTTR. This measures how long it typically takes to recover from a failure. It's crucial for understanding how quickly you can get back on track after an issue arises. Mean time to failure, MTTF. This is the average time until a system or component fails. Unlike MTBF, which applies to repairable items, MTTF applies to non-repairable items. Failure in time, FIT. This tool measures the number of failures expected in a billion hours of operation. It helps in understanding the reliability of systems over time. Annualized rate of occurrence, ARO. Using historical data, ARO predicts how often a risk might occur within a year. This helps you gauge the frequency of potential risks based on past incidents. By utilizing these quantitative tools, you can get a clearer picture of how likely certain risks are to occur and plan your strategies accordingly. When conducting a quantitative risk assessment, it's crucial to gather reliable data from various sources to make informed decisions. Here are some key sources of quantitative risk data. Law enforcement agencies. They provide crime statistics relevant to your facilities, helping you understand the likelihood of vandalism, break-ins, or other risks that could affect your operations or personnel. Insurance companies. They offer insights into risks experienced by other businesses and the financial impact of those risks. This data can be invaluable for understanding potential liabilities and setting appropriate coverage levels. Computer Incident Monitoring Organizations. These organizations track and analyze data on technology-related risks, including system failures and cyber attacks. Their reports can help you anticipate and prepare for tech-specific threats. Using data from these sources can significantly enhance the accuracy of your risk assessments and help you develop more effective risk management strategies. Understanding the potential financial impact of risks is essential for effective risk management. To do this, we use a few key formulas to estimate potential losses. Single Loss Expectancy SLE. This measures the expected monetary loss each time a risk occurs. It's a straightforward way to estimate the financial impact of a single event. Annualized Loss Expectancy AL. This formula calculates the expected loss over a year. It combines the SLE with the likelihood of the risk happening within that year, giving you a yearly perspective on potential financial impact. Risk Exposure Factor ref. This factor is calculated by multiplying the probability of a risk occurring by the total potential loss. It helps in understanding how likely a risk is to materialize and the financial consequences of that risk. By applying these formulas, you can better gauge the financial risks your assets face and prioritize your risk management efforts accordingly.
A risk register is like a comprehensive inventory of all potential threats and associated risks. It provides a clear snapshot of vulnerabilities and helps you keep track of Key risk indicators. These are the primary factors that could lead to risk. Risk owners. Individuals or teams responsible for managing the asset. Risk threshold. The maximum amount of risk your organization is willing to tolerate. Additionally, a risk matrix or heat map is a visual tool that helps you quickly assess the impact and likelihood of different risks. It uses color coding to make it easy to see which risks are more severe and need immediate attention. Together, these tools help in organizing and visualizing risks, making it easier to manage and mitigate them effectively. When it comes to managing risks, understanding your risk tolerance and risk appetite is crucial. Risk tolerance is the level of risk that your organization is willing to accept for individual risks. It's like the maximum amount of risk you're okay with on a case-by-case -case basis. On the other hand, risk appetite refers to the total amount of risk your organization can bear overall. This can vary. Conservative. The organization prefers to avoid risk as much as possible. Expansionary. The organization is open to higher levels of risk for potential growth. Neutral. The organization maintains a balanced approach to risk. Managing risk involves a mix of strategies, including addressing third-party risks and applying awareness management to keep everyone informed and prepared. When it comes to handling risks, there are four main strategies you can use. Accept. Sometimes, you just acknowledge the risk and decide not to take any action. It's a bit like knowing there's a storm coming but choosing not to change your plans. Transfer. This involves shifting the risk to someone else, like outsourcing certain tasks or buying insurance. It's like passing the risk off to a third party. Avoid. Here, you identify the risk and simply choose not to engage in the activity that causes it. For instance, avoiding a risky investment entirely. Mitigate. This strategy is about reducing the impact or likelihood of the risk. It's like reinforcing your house before a storm to minimize damage. Each strategy helps you manage risks in different ways, so you can decide which one fits your situation best. Working with third parties can come with its own set of risks, especially when coordinating their activities with your organization. Here are some key areas where risks can arise. Onboarding and offboarding. Bringing third parties into your system and then removing them can be complex. It's crucial to manage these transitions smoothly to avoid security gaps. Application and social media network sharing. Integrating third-party applications or sharing data on social media networks can introduce vulnerabilities. It's important to ensure these integrations are secure. Privacy and risk awareness. Third parties might have different standards for privacy and risk awareness. Ensuring they align with your organization's policies is essential to protect sensitive information. Data considerations. Handling data with third parties requires careful attention. You need to manage how data is shared, stored, and protected to avoid breaches. Each of these areas requires careful management to reduce the risks associated with third-party integrations. To effectively manage risks associated with third-party vendors, it's crucial to implement strict oversight measures. Here's how you can reduce risks. Vendor questionnaires. Have vendors fill out detailed questionnaires about their supply chain security measures. This helps you understand their security practices and identify any potential gaps. Regular penetration testing. Require vendors to conduct regular penetration testing. This ensures they are continuously checking for vulnerabilities in their systems. Evidence of internal audits. Ask for proof of their internal audits. This shows that they are actively monitoring their own security and compliance. Rules of engagement. Establish clear rules of engagement. These guidelines outline how the vendor should interact with your systems and data. Due diligence. Make sure third parties follow thorough due diligence practices. This includes vetting their security protocols and ensuring they meet your organization's standards. By implementing these measures, you can significantly reduce the risks associated with third-party vendors and safeguard your organization's assets.
When working with third-party vendors, it's essential to have clear and comprehensive agreements in place. Here are some common types of vendor agreements you might encounter. Service Level Agreement SLA, defines the level of service expected from the vendor and includes performance metrics, response times, and responsibilities. Business Partnership Agreement BPA, outlines the terms of a partnership, including each party's roles, contributions, and shared objectives. Memorandum of Understanding MO, a formal document that establishes a mutual agreement between parties, often used to outline collaborative goals and responsibilities. Non-disclosure agreement NDA, ensures that sensitive information shared between parties remains confidential and is not disclosed to unauthorized individuals. Measurement System Analysis MSA, assesses the accuracy and reliability of measurement systems used by the vendor, ensuring they meet quality standards. Memorandum of Agreement, MOA, similar to an MOU but usually more detailed, it defines the specific terms of the agreement and the responsibilities of each party. Work Order, WO, Statement of Work, SO, details the specific tasks or deliverables expected from the vendor, including timelines, costs, and performance criteria. These agreements help set clear expectations and provide a framework for managing vendor relationships effectively. Security Awareness Management, or Risk Awareness, is all about getting everyone in your organization on the same page about potential risks and how to handle them. The main goal of this training is to help users recognize unusual or suspicious behavior that might indicate a security threat. Here's what we're aiming for. Understanding risks. Employees should be aware of the different risks that could impact the organization and understand the potential consequences. Anomalous behavior recognition. Training should enable users to spot behavior that doesn't fit the norm. This includes anything unexpected or out of the ordinary that could pose a risk. Situation awareness. Essentially, this means being able to assess and respond to situations that seem unusual or risky. It's about having the insight to recognize when something is off, even if it's not immediately obvious. By boosting security awareness, we empower everyone to be an active participant in protecting the organization from potential threats. When it comes to training users on security awareness, there are several effective techniques you can use. Computer-based training CBT. This involves using online modules or software to deliver training content. It's flexible and allows users to learn at their own pace. Role-based awareness training. This approach tailors training to the specific roles and responsibilities of different employees. It ensures that the training is relevant to their daily tasks and the risks they face. Gamification. Incorporating game-like elements into training can make learning more engaging and enjoyable. It can include quizzes, challenges, and rewards to motivate users and reinforce learning. Fishing simulations. These simulate real phishing attacks to test users' ability to recognize and respond to fraudulent emails or messages. It helps in identifying vulnerabilities and improving response strategies. These techniques help ensure that all employees are well prepared to recognize and manage security risks effectively. Knowledge Check Which of the following is not a third-party risk? Onboarding, social media network sharing, risk awareness, or network assignment? Answer, network assignment. Network assignment is not a risk. Before we wrap up, let's take a moment to reflect on what we've covered. I want you to assess how confident you feel about the key objectives we've discussed in this module. On a scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being, I've got this down cold, and one being, I'm still pretty unsure, rate yourself on the following. How well can you explain asset protections? How comfortable are you with describing risk management? If you find yourself scoring below A4 on either of these, it might be worth revisiting the material and exercises we went through. This will help solidify your understanding and ensure you're well prepared moving forward. As we wrap up Module 15, let's quickly review what you've learned. We've dived into the critical aspects of asset protection and risk management, understanding how to safeguard organizational assets, 
identify and evaluate risks, and implement strategies to mitigate those risks effectively. You've also gained insight into managing third-party risks and the importance of security awareness within an organization. Thank you for sticking with me through this module and throughout the course. Your engagement and effort have been crucial in mastering these concepts. If you found this content helpful, I'd appreciate it if you could like, subscribe, and share it with others who might benefit. Don't forget to leave a comment, I'd love to hear your thoughts or any questions you might have. This concludes all the content for this course, but if you're eager to learn more, be sure to check out my channel for other courses that might catch your interest. There's always something new to explore and learn. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you in another course soon.